The Hitchhiker by Lucille Fletcher. <clears throat> Wells. Good evening. This is Orson Wells. Music fades in. Personally, I've never met anybody who didn't like a good ghost story, but I know a lot of people who think there are a lot of people who don't like a good ghost story. For the benefit of these, at least, I go on record at the outset of this evening's entertainment with the sober assurance that although blood may be curdled on this program, none will be spilt. There's no shooting, knifing, throttling, axing, or poisoning here. No clanking chains, no cobwebs, no, bone, no bony and or hairy hands appearing from secret panels, or better yet, bedroom curtains. If it's any part of that dear old phosphorescent foolishness that people who don't like ghost stories don't like, then again, I promise you we haven't got it. What we do have is a thriller. If it's half as good as we think it is, you can call it a shocker, and we present it proudly and without apologies. After all, a story doesn't have to appeal to the heart. It can also appeal to the spine. Sometimes you want your heart to be warmed, Sometimes you want your spine to tingle. The tingling, it's to be hoped, will be quite audible as you listen tonight to The Hitchhiker. That's the name of our story, The Hitchhiker. Sound of the automobile wheels humming over concrete can be heard as music is playing that is something weird and shuddery. Adams. I'm in an auto camp on Route 66, just west of Gallup, New Mexico. If I tell it, perhaps it will help me. It will keep me from going mad, but I must tell this quickly. I am not mad now. I feel perfectly well, except that I am running a slight temperature. My name is Ronald Adams. I'm 36 years of age, unmarried, tall, dark, with a black mustache. I drive a 1940 Ford V8, license number 6V7989. I was born in Brooklyn. All this I know. I know that I am not at this moment perfectly sane. That it is not I who has gone mad, but something else, something utterly beyond my control. But I must speak quickly. At any moment, the link with life may break. This may be the last thing I ever tell on earth, the last night I ever see the stars. Music fades in. Adams. Six days ago, I left Brooklyn to drive to California. Mother. Goodbye, son. Good luck to you, my boy. Adams. Goodbye, mother. Here, give me a kiss, then I'll go. Mother. I'll come out with you to the car. Oh, no, it's raining. Stay here at the door. Hey, what is this? Tears? I thought you promised me you wouldn't cry. Mother. I know, dear. I'm sorry, but I do hate to see you go. Adams. I'll be back. I'll only be on the coast three months. Mother, oh, it, it isn't that. It's just the trip, Ronald. I wish you weren't driving. Adams, oh, mother, there you go again. People do it every day. Mother, I know, but you'll be careful, won't you? Promise me you'll be extra careful. Don't fall asleep or drive fast or pick up any strangers on the road. Of course not. You'd think I was still 17 to hear you talk. Mother, and wire me as soon as you get to Hollywood, won't you, son? Adams, of course I will. Now don't you worry. There isn't anything going to happen. It's just eight days of perfectly simple driving on smooth, decent, civilized roads with a hot dog or a hamburger stand every ten miles. Adams fades out, and the sound of the auto humming in the background can be heard. Adams, I was in excellent spirits. The drive ahead of me, even the loneliness, seemed like a lark. But I reckoned without him. Music changes to something weird and empty. Adams. Crossing Brooklyn Bridge that morning in the rain, I saw a man leaning against the cables. He seemed to be waiting for a lift. There were spots of fresh rain on his shoulders. He was carrying a cheap overnight bag in one hand. He was thin, nondescript with a cap pulled down over his eyes. He stepped off the walk, and if I hadn't swerved, I would have hit him. Sound of terrific skidding can be heard as music fades in. Adams, I would have forgotten him completely, except that just an hour later, while crossing the Pulaski Skyway over the Jersey Flats, I saw him again. 
At least he looked like the same person. He was standing now with one thumb pointing west. I couldn't figure out how he'd got there, but I thought probably one of those fast trucks had picked him up, beaten me to the skyway, and let him off. I didn't stop for him. Then, late that night, I saw him again. Music changing. Adams. It was on the new Pennsylvania Turnpike between Harrisburg and Pittsburgh. It's 265 miles long with a very high speed limit. I was just slowing down for one of the tunnels when I saw him standing under an arc light by the side of the road. I could see him quite distinctly. The bag, the cap, even the spots of fresh rain spattered over his shoulders. He hailed me this time. Voice, very spooky and faint. Hello, echoing as though through a tunnel. Hello, Adams. I stepped on the gas like a shot. That's lonely country through the Alleghenies, and I had no intention of stopping. Besides, the coincidence, or whatever it was, gave me the willies. I stopped at the ga next gas station. The sound of auto tires screeching to a stop and a horn honking can be heard. Mechanic. Yes, sir. Adams. Fill her up. Certainly, sir. Check your oil, sir. Adams. No, thanks. The sound of gas being put into a car can be heard. Gas station bell can be heard. Mechanic. Nice night, isn't it? Adams. Uh, yes, it hasn't been raining here recently, has it? Mechanic. Not a drop of rain all week. Hmm. I suppose that hasn't done your business any harm. Mechanic. Oh, people drive through here all kinds of weather. Mostly business, you know. There aren't many pleasure cars out on the turnpike this season of the year. Adams. I suppose not. Actually, what about hitchhikers? <laughs> hitchhikers here? Adams. Yeah, what's the matter? Didn't you ever see any? Mechanic. Not much. If we did, it'd be a sight for sore eyes. Adams. Well, why? Mechanic. A guy'd be a fool who started out to hitch rides on this road. Look at it. It's 265 miles long. There's practically no speed limit, and it's a straightaway. Now, what car is going to stop to pick up a guy under those conditions? Would you stop? No, he says slowly with puzzled emphasis. Then you've never seen anybody? Mechanic. Nope. Maybe they get the lift before the turnpike starts. I mean, you know, just before the toll house. But then it'd be a mighty long ride. Most cars wouldn't want to pick up a guy for that long a ride. And you know, this is pretty lonesome country here. Mountains, woods. You ain't seen anybody like that, have you? Uh, no. Oh, no, not at all. It was just a technical question. Mechanic. I see. Well, that'll be just $1.49 with tax. Auto sound of the car humming and starting up music begins to change adams the thing gradually passed from my mind as sheer coincidence i had a good night's sleep in pittsburgh i did not think about the man all next day until just outside of zanesville ohio i saw him again music plays dark ominous music adams it was a bright sunshiny afternoon the peaceful ohio fields Brown with the autumn stubble, lay dreaming in the golden light. I was driving slowly, drinking it in, when the road suddenly ended in a detour. In front of the barrier, he was standing. Adams, let me explain something about his appearance before I go on. I repeat, there was nothing sinister about him. He was as drab as a mud fence. He was, nor was his attitude menacing. He merely stood there, waiting, almost drooping a little, the cheap overnight bag in his hand. He looked as though he had been waiting there for hours. Then he looked up. He hailed me. He started to walk forward. Voice from far off. Hello. Hello. Adams. I had stopped the car, of course, for the detour, and for a few moments I couldn't seem to find the new road. I knew he must be thinking that I had stopped for him. The voice closer. Hello, hello, sound of car gears jamming, the sound of motor turning over hard, and nervous accelerator can be heard, voice closer, hello, 
Adams, panicking. No, not, not just now. Sorry. Voice. Going to California? Sound. The starter starting, gears jamming. Adams, as though sweating blood. No, no, not today. The other way. Going to New York. Sorry. The sound. The car starts with a squeal of wheels on dirt into the auto humming. Music begins to play. Adams, after I got the car back onto the road again, I felt like a fool. Yet the thought of picking him up, of having him sit beside me, was somehow unbearable. Yet at the same time, I felt, more than ever, unspeakably alone. The sound of the auto car humming. Adams, hour after hour went by. The fields... The towns ticked off one by one. The lights changed. I knew now that I was going to see him again. And though I dreaded the sight, I caught myself searching the side of the road, waiting for him to appear. Sound of the auto humming. Car screeches to a halt. Impatient honk two or three times. Door being unbolted. Sleepy man's voice. Yeah, what time is it? What do you want? Adams, breathless. You sell sandwiches? And pop here, don't you? Voice. Yeah, we do. In the daytime. But we're closed up for now. For the night. Adams. I know, but I was wondering if you could possibly let me have a cup of coffee. Black coffee. Voice. Not at this time of night, mister. My wife's the cook and she's in bed. Maybe further down the road. At the honeysuckle rest? Sound. The door squeaking on hinges as though being closed. Adams, no, no, don't shut the door. Listen, just a minute ago, there was a man standing here, right beside his, this stand, a, a suspicious-looking man. Woman's voice can be heard from the distance. Henry, who is it? Henry. Henry, it's nobody, mother. Just a feller thinks he wants a cup of coffee. Go back to bed. Adams. I don't mean to disturb you, but you see, I was driving along when I just happened to look, and there he was. Henry, what was he doing? Nothing. He ran off when I stopped the car. Henry, then what of it? That's nothing to wake a man in the middle of, the, of his sleep about. Young man, I've got a good mind to turn you over to the sheriff. Adams, but I... Henry, you've been taking a nip. That's what you've been doing. And you haven't got anything better to do than wake decent folk out of their hard-earned sleep. Get going. Go on. Adams. But he looked as though he were going to rob you. Henry. I ain't got nothing in this stand to lose. Now, on your way before I call out Sheriff Oaks. He fades away. The sound of the car starting up can be heard. Adams, I got into the car and drove on slowly. I was beginning to hate the car. If I could have found a place to stop to rest a little, but I was in the Ozark Mountains of Missouri now. The few resort places there were closed. Only an occasional log cabin, seemingly deserted, broke the monotony of the wild, wooded landscape. I had seen him at that roadside stand. I knew I would see him again, perhaps at the next turn of the road. I knew that when I saw him next, I would run him down. The sound of the car humming up can be heard. Adams, but I did not see him again until late next afternoon. The sound of a railroad warning signal at crossroads can be heard. Adams, I had stopped the car at a little, a sleepy little junction across, just across the border into Oklahoma to let a train pass by when he appeared across the tracks, leaning against a telephone pole. The sound, distant sound of train chugging, the bell ringing steadily. Adams, very tense, says, it was a perfectly airless dry day. The red clay of Oklahoma was baking under the southwestern sun. Yet there were spots of fresh rain on his shoulders. I couldn't stand that. Without thinking blindly, I started the car across the tracks. The sound of the train chugging closer could be heard. Adams, he didn't even look up at me. He was staring at the ground. I stepped on the gas hard, veering the wheel sharply toward him. I could hear the train in the distance now, but I didn't care. Then something went wrong with the car. It stalled right on the tracks. The sound, train chugging closer, above the sound of the car stalling. Adams, the train was coming closer. I could hear its bell ringing and the cry of its whistle. Still, he stood there, and now I knew that he was beckoning, beckoning me to my death. 
The sound of the train chugging close. Whistle blows wildly. Then the train rushes up and by with pistons going. Adams, well, I frustrated him that time. The starter had worked at last. I managed to back up, but when the train passed, he was gone. I was all alone in the hot, dry afternoon. Sound, train retreating, crickets begin to sing, music fades in. Adams, after that, I knew I had to do something. I didn't know who this man was or what he wanted of me. I only knew that from now on, I must not let myself be alone on the road for one moment. Sound, auto of the car, humming, slowing down, stopping. The door opens. Adams, hello there. Like a ride? Girl, what do you think? How far are you going? Adams, Amarillo. I'll take you to Amarillo. Girl, Amarillo, Texas? Adams, I'll drive you there. Girl, gee. The door closes. The car starts up again. Music fades in. Girl, mind if I take my shoes off? My dogs are killing me. Adams, go right ahead. Girl, gee, what a break this is. A swell car, a decent guy, and driving all the way to Amarillo? All I've been getting so far is trucks. Adams, you hitchhike much? Girl, sure. Only it's tough sometimes in these great open spaces to get the brakes. Adams, I should think it would be. Though, I'll bet if you get a good pickup in a fast car, you can get to places faster than, say, another person in another car? Girl, I don't get you. Adams, well, take me, for instance. Suppose I'm driving across the country, say, at a nice steady clip of about 45 miles an hour. Couldn't a girl like you, just standing beside the road waiting for lifts, beat me to town after town, provided she got picked up every time in a car doing from 65 to 70 miles an hour? Girl, I don't know. Maybe she could and maybe she couldn't. What difference does it make? Adams, oh, no difference. It's just a crazy idea I had sitting here in the car. Girl, <laughs> imagine spending your time in a swell car thinking of things like that. Adams, well, what would you do instead? Girl says admiringly, what would I do if I was a good-looking fella like yourself? Why, I'd just enjoy myself every minute of the time. I'd sit back and relax, and if I saw a good-looking girl along the side of the road, hey, look out! Adams breathlessly, did you see him too? Girl, see who? That man, standing beside the barbed wire fence. Girl, I didn't see anybody. There wasn't nothing but a bunch of steers and the barbed wire fence. What do you think you're, you, you, were, you was doing, trying to run into the barbed wire fence? Adams, there was a man there, I tell you, a gray, a thin gray man with an overnight bag in his hand, and I was trying to run him down. Girl, you run him down? You mean kill him? Adam, Adam says, he's a sort of phantom. I'm trying to get rid of him or else prove that he's real, but you say you didn't see him back there? You sure? I didn't see a soul, and as far as that's concerned, mister... Adams, watch for him next time then. Keep watching. Keep your eyes peeled on the road. He'll turn up. Maybe any minute now. Look, there. There he is. The car, sharply veering and skidding. The girl screams. Sound of a crash of the car going into barbed wire fence. Frightening lowing of steer. Mm. Girl, how does this door work? I, I'm getting out of here. Did you see him that time? No, I didn't see him that time. And personally, mister, I don't expect never to see him. All I want to do is go on living, and I don't see how I will very long driving with you. Adams, I'm sorry. I, I don't know what came over me. Please, please don't go. Girl, so if you'll excuse me, mister. Adams, you can't go. Listen, how would you like to go to California? I'll drive you to California. Girl, seeing pink elephants all the way. No, thanks. Adams, Please, I, I could get you a job there. You wouldn't have to be a waitress. I have friends there. My name is Ronald Adams. You can check. Sound of the door opening. Girl, uh-uh. Thanks just the same. Adams, listen, please, for just one minute. Maybe you think I'm half cracked. But this man, you see, I've been seeing this man all the way across the country. He's been following me. And if you could only help me, stay with me until I reach the coast. You know what I think you need, big boy? Not a girlfriend, just a good dose of sleep. There, I got it now. The door opens and slams shut. No, you can't go. 
girl. Ah, leave your hands off of me. Do you hear? Leave your... Adams, come back here. Please come back. Sound of a struggle. Slap. Footsteps running away on gravel. Adams, she ran for me as though I were a monster. A few minutes later, I saw a passing truck pick her up. I knew then that I was utterly alone. Adams, I was in the heart of the great Texas prairies. There wasn't a car on the road after the truck went by. I tried to figure out what to do, how to get a hold of myself, if I could find a place to rest, or even if I could sleep right here in the car for a few hours along the side of the road. I was getting my winter overcoat out of the back seat to use as a blanket. Hello, when I saw him coming toward me. Hello, emerging from the herd of moving steer voice. Hello! Hello! The car starts up violently. Adams, I didn't wait for him to come any closer. Perhaps I should have spoken to him then, fought it out then and there, for now he began to be everywhere. Wherever I stopped, even for a moment, for gas, for oil, for a drink of pop, a cup of coffee, a sandwich, he was there. I saw him standing outside the auto camp in Amarillo that night, when I dared to slow down. He was sitting near the drinking fountain in a little camping spot just inside the border of New Mexico. Adams, he was waiting for me outside the Navajo reservation where I stopped to check my tires. I saw him in Albuquerque where I bought 12 gallons of gas. I was afraid now, afraid to stop. I began to drive faster and faster. I was in lunar landscape now, the great arid Mesa country of New Mexico. I drove through it with the indifference of a fly crawling over the face of the moon. But now he didn't even wait for me to stop. Unless I drove at 85 miles an hour over those endless roads, he waited for me at every other mile. I would see his figure, shadowless, flitting before me, still in the same attitude, over the cold and lifeless ground, flitting over dried up rivers, over broken stones cast up by old glacial upheavals, flitting in the pure and cloudless air. Adams, I was beside myself when I finally reached Gallup, New Mexico this morning. There is an auto camp here, cold, almost deserted at this time of the year. I went inside and asked if there was a telephone. I had the feeling that if only I could speak to someone familiar, someone that I loved, I could pull myself together. The sound of a nickel being put into the slot of a telephone booth can be heard. Operator, number please. Adams, long distance. Operator, thank you. Bzzz, long distance operator. This is long distance. Adams, I'd like to put in a call to my home in Brooklyn, New York. I'm Ronald Adams. The number is Beechwood, 20828. Long distance operator. Thank you. What is your number? Adams, 312. Albuquerque operator. Albuquerque, long distance operator. New York for Gallup. New York operator. New York, long distance operator. Gallup, New Mexico, calling Beechwood 20828. Adams, I had read somewhere that love could banish demons. It was the middle of the morning. I knew Mother would be home. I pictured her tall, white-haired, in her crisp house dress, going about her tasks. It would be enough, I thought, merely to hear the even calmness of her voice. Long-distance operator. Will you please deposit $3.85 for the first three minutes? When you have deposited a dollar and a half, will you wait until I have collected the money? Sound of coins. Long distance operator. All right, deposit another dollar and a half. Sound the clunking of six coins. Long distance operator. Will you please deposit the remaining 85 cents? Sound of the clunking of four coins. Long distance operator. Ready with Brooklyn. Go ahead, please. Adams. Hello? Mrs. Whitney, Mrs. Adams residence. Adams, hello, hello, mother. Mrs. Whitney, this is Mrs. Adams's residence. Who is it that you wish to speak to, please? Adams, why, who's this? Mrs. Whitney, this is Mrs. Whitney. Adams, Mrs. Whitney, I, I don't know any Mrs. Whitney. Is this Beechwood 20828? Yes. Adams, where's my mother? Where's Mrs. Adams? Mrs. Whitney, 
Mrs. Adams is not at home. She's still in the hospital. Adams. <gasps> the hospital? Mrs. Whitney. Yes. Who is this calling, please? Is it a member of the family? Adams. What's she in the hospital for? Mrs. Whitney. She's been prostrated for five days. Nervous breakdown. But who is this calling? Adams. Nervous breakdown. But my mother was never nervous. Mrs. Whitney. It's all taken place since the death of her oldest son, Ronald. Adams. Death of her oldest son, Ronald? Uh, hey, what is this? What number is this? Mrs. Whitney. This is Beechwood, 20828. It's all been very sudden. He was killed just six days ago in an automobile accident on the Brooklyn Bridge. Long distance operator breaking in. Your three minutes are up, sir. Your three minutes are up, sir. Your three minutes are up, sir. Sir, your three minutes are up. Your three minutes are up, sir. Adams. And so I'm sitting here in this deserted auto camp in Gallup, New Mexico. I'm trying to think. I'm trying to get a hold of myself. Otherwise, I shall go mad. Outside, it is night the vast, soulless night of New Mexico. A million stars are in the sky. Ahead of me stretch a thousand miles of empty mesa, mountains, prairies, desert. Somewhere among them he is waiting for me. Somewhere I shall know who he is and who I am. <laughs>